One of our ongoing research projects is the loggerhead shrike study. The loggerhead shrike is a songbird that acts like a raptor. It can be found in grasslands and other open habitats throughout much of North America and is often easily spotted on telephone lines. Although this bird is small, it is a talented hunter. Its prey includes insects and other arthropods, small reptiles, mice, birds such as goldfinches and sparrows, frogs, and even squirrels. Wow, that's quite the hit list. Loggerhead shrikes are not only good hunters, but they're also intelligent. They often use tools such as barbed wire or sticks to impale their prey upon. This helps to kill the prey quickly and with less bite, and also lets them eat their prey without the long talons of a raptor. They also do this when they go for noxious or poisonous prey like monarch butterflies. They impale them and then wait for a few days to eat them. This allows time for the poisons to break down. That's one smart bird. Despite their many talents, loggerhead shrike numbers have dropped sharply in the last half century. Over the course of the breeding bird survey, which started in 1966, loggerhead shrike populations have declined by 79%, and thus it is listed as endangered, threatened, or as a species of concern across a large portion of its range. The loggerhead shrike's plight epitomizes the dire conservation status of many grassland bird species, as its decline is largely attributed to habitat degradation and loss. Shrikes prefer open country with scattered bushes, much of which has been transformed into large monocultures of alfalfa and corn. The use of pesticides in agriculture has also been linked to the decline of loggerhead shrike populations. With our loggerhead shrike study, we are looking at another possible factor in the population decline. Certain constraints associated with winter habitat could be limiting the migratory populations of this species. This species has both migratory and non-migratory resident populations. The Texas Gulf Coastal Prairie contains both migrant and resident shrikes during the non-breeding season, which is winter. This means that the resident birds who have been here all year long are suddenly joined by a bunch of migratory shrikes in the winter. This leads to the question of how migratory and resident populations coexist during the winter. Several hypotheses have been proposed that residents outcompete migrants due to the advantage of prior occupancy, site tenacity, and familiarity with the area, thus relegating the migrants to lesser quality habitat. Poor winter habitat affects breeding success in the following spring, so this could be very detrimental for migratory populations. Along the Gulf Coast, relatively little is known about the population dynamics of migrant versus resident shrikes due in part to the difficulties associated with distinguishing them from one another. But recently, techniques have been developed using stable hydrogen isotopes in combination with genetic markers found in feathers to distinguish migrant from resident shrikes. This allows us to better understand habitat divisions between migrant and resident shrikes, determine the proportion of migrant to resident shrikes, and determine the breeding origin of migrant shrikes wintering in the Gulf Coast. Because collecting feathers for these analyses requires the birds to be caught, we can at the same time apply color bands, which uniquely identify individual birds. We can also apply modus transmitters, nanotags, to some of these birds. This will allow us to track the birds manually and using our existing modus network to determine winter habitat affiliations for individuals. We can use the habitat affiliation data to provide valuable information on differences in habitat quality for migrant and resident shrikes. To learn more about this study, I went out with our Director of Conservation Research, Sue Heath, to catch some loggerhead shrikes. Sue works with Jennifer Wilson, who is a biologist at the Texas Midcoast National Wildlife Refuge Complex, to capture shrikes for her study. On this day, she had scoped out a couple of shrikes at the Brazoria Wildlife Refuge and at Surfside Beach. We started with the Brazoria one. We find it easily perched in the same area it's always in. To catch shrikes, Sue has made this nifty trap that will catch the bird safely without hurting it. She uses a mouse named Pinto for live bait. Don't worry, Pinto doesn't get hurt. Sue places the trap in an open, flat area where the bird can see it. 
Then we hurry to hide. The shrike seems uninterested. It flies down to check out the trap once, then goes off to catch easier prey. This one might be too smart for us. After waiting for a while with no luck, we pack everything up and head to Surfside. This time, Sue barely has made it back to the car before the shrike dives to the trap. These birds are smart, but they haven't seen anything like this trap before. It takes a few minutes of hopping around before it figures out how to get in. As soon as the bird is inside, the trap door is triggered and closes. We run to get the bird out quickly so it can't hurt itself. Sue removes the bird carefully as Jennifer prepares the supplies. She keeps careful notes about all the birds they research and band. These bands are lightweight plastic. The bird will get a combination of three color bands and one silver metal USGS band to distinguish it from all the other shrikes. This bird gets white, white, light green, and silver bands. No other shrike has that color combination, so if we see those colors again through our binoculars, we know exactly which shrike it is. She opens each band and carefully places it around the bird's legs. These bands are lightweight and loose, so they will not hurt the bird. Next, the researchers take measurements. They measure things like beak, wings, and the weight of the bird. This will help them keep track of overall population health and any growth abnormalities that might occur in individuals or groups. Next, Jennifer takes a few feathers from the bird. These will be sent to be tested using those techniques we talked about earlier, using stable hydrogen isotopes in combination with genetic markers. This will tell us roughly where the bird comes from and if it's a migrant or a resident. Finally, Sue outfits the bird with a cool new backpack. Just kidding, it's the nano tag that will allow us to track the bird in the future. The MODIS Wildlife Tracking System is an international collaborative research network. It uses a coordinated automated radio telemetry array to track the movement and behavior of small birds and other organisms affixed with nano tags. The signals from the nano tags are detected by radio telemetry stations that scan for signals 24 hours a day, seven days a week. GCBO and the Refuge have 15 MODIS towers set up along the Texas coast to detect migrants outfitted with nano tags and also birds in local studies like the shrikes. The nano tag and the bands are less than 4% of the bird's body weight and are positioned to be unobtrusive to movement. For a bird who can take down a whole squirrel, these things definitely won't weigh it down. With that, the bird is ready to be set free. We place it back where we found it in an open place. It takes a few moments for it to get used to the new outfit, then flies away. The MODIS network will keep track of this bird's location within a 12 kilometer radius. But for more exact location data, Sue and her volunteers have to go out and find the birds with handheld VHF antennas. They scan the area where the bird was banded and pick up a signal in the direction of the bird. When two volunteers do this at once, they are able to triangulate and find the bird's location. The volunteers stand far apart and each point their antennas towards the bird's signal. Then they take the compass bearings and a GPS point from where they're standing. From there, Jennifer is able to figure out the bird's exact GPS location. After enough of these points are collected, we're able to roughly map out the bird's territory. This will allow us to learn how different birds use their habitat, and if migrating and resident birds coexist, or if the migrants are pushed to less desirable territories. In the future, this information could allow us to better protect these birds and their habitats. This species is in peril, so it's crucial that we understand the problems that they're facing in order to better help them. If you would like to learn more about this study or our other conservation work, visit us online at gcbo.org.